It's true, I do play the didgeridoo. Uh, I bought mine in Wales, of all places, would you believe? But, uh, and the, the funny thing was, I was flying back from Wales to Scotland uh, via Belfast. So, and this was during a time of the troubles in Belfast. So trying to get on a plane with what looked like a rocket launcher wrapped in uh, plastic was an interesting experience. Uh, I do want to thank you all for the questions. Um, too many for me to answer at the beginning of, of, the, of the session. I, I picked out just three I'm going to briefly address. Uh, I do want to say one of, the, one of the great pleasures of giving lectures uh, at, at an institution that is not my home institution and which represents in many ways a different culture and also a different, slightly different Christian tradition is that I get asked questions that I wouldn't necessarily be asked back home, which makes me think about things in a different way. So it's extremely helpful to get questions from you on this. I know that uh, the, the desire of the, the more uh, college lectures, the, the intention is that they do get published at some point. So it's extremely helpful for me as I'm thinking about how to develop these lectures into a written form to have questions that are pushing me and pressing me on certain issues. So I'm very, very grateful for those. The three I pulled out, uh, two of them I can address fairly briefly, one of them perhaps not quite so briefly. Uh, one of them is in the pulpit at the water cooler on the soccer sideline. There's a growing sense among Christians of the intimidation and potential incarceration or litigation that may come by expressing Christian dissent at the modern mind and culture. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions on this? That's a huge question, of course. Just one thing I would say is I don't think Christians should be frightened to use their legal and constitutional rights to protect their religious liberties. Uh, Paul used his Roman citizenship. And I think now is the time to be organizing on that front. You know, Christians suing Christians is a trickier thing. Christians uh, using the rights they possess as citizens of free nations is quite a different thing. And I think now is the time to be coordinating. I don't know how it's going to work out in Australia, but I think in America what will happen is that religious liberty will be closed down, first of all, through uh, getting voluntary organizations that receive government money, then through colleges that receive government money and accreditation, and then the churches. That's how I think it will go. So I think it's, uh, it's important that voluntary organizations, colleges, and churches are already thinking about how they can organize why has, uh, why has the, the, the sexual uh, lobby triumphed so dramatically in the political realm? Very well organized lobby groups. I think if we look at their strategy, we could probably learn some things that may help us. So I think uh, we should not be afraid to use our legal rights while we still have them. Uh, and we should also be thinking about organizing and coordinating with, with like-minded people. Um, secondly, <clears throat> In terms of the categories of the modern mind, psychology, technology, aesthetics, and historical, how much of it seems to be about identity, what interplay does identity have with idolatry, and how does the Bible, the gospel, speak into that? Not going to address the whole of this question. All I would say is that there are, you know, there are legitimate identities. We all possess various identities. Parents, children, uh, patriots. Uh, supporters of football teams. There are all kinds of identities that we all possess. I think what the Bible warns us against is making any of those identities uh, the absolute foundation of who we are. I was thinking, as I, as I was thinking of answering this question, Matthew 10, 37 came to mind. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I don't think Jesus is saying there that uh, mothers sh and fathers shouldn't love their children and children shouldn't love their parents. Uh, that's entirely appropriate. Those identities are legitimate. What he's saying there is that those identities must not become so important uh, that they end up supplanting the Lord Jesus Christ in one's identity or fracturing his kingdom uh, in some way. Um, last, uh, the last one, now this is perhaps a more complicated but in some ways very interesting question. If the aesthetic has replaced moral outrage, how do we make sense of the modern outrage that still exists against things like human trafficking, rape, terrorism, and the last taboo, which uh, I mentioned yesterday was pedophilia. Um, I think that there's a sense in which we're made in the image of God, and so uh, there is still an instinctive knowledge uh, 
of right or wrong in us. We can suppress that, we can distort it, but I think there is still a moral dimension to being a human being. Having said that, I do think that some of the moral, some of what expresses itself as moral outrage these days is remarkably poorly grounded, which leads me to believe that perhaps taste plays into it more than we think. And, I, and pedophilia would be a good example of that. Uh, if you ask me why I object to pedophilia, I would say, well, sexual activity is to be the seal of the exclusive relationship between a man and a woman in the lifelong bond of marriage. That's what the Bible, I think, teaches. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer sums it up beautifully, I think, in its description of the purpose of marriage. The union of husband and wife in heart, body, and mind is intended by God for their mutual joy, for the help and comfort given one another in prosperity and adversity. And when it is God's will for the procreation of children and their nurture in the knowledge and love of the Lord. If you like, marriage is there for uh, sex, uh, procreation, and lifelong friendship and support. I think it's a wonderful summary of the biblical teaching. Uh, so why do I object to paedophilia? Because it is yet another example, perhaps an extreme example, of an abusive use of God's gift of sex outside of the context of marriage for which it's intended. The problem the modern mind will have with that, of course, is that it's reduced sex to a fun recreation that brings pleasure to the party engaged in it. Uh, why does the modern mind object to paedophilia? Well, I suspect probably the answer is going to come back because it's forced on the child against their will. There's no consent. Uh, problem with that is, of course, we force children to do lots of things to which they do not willingly consent. Sent my kids to school. Uh, they didn't consent to that. Made my kids eat vegetables. They didn't consent to that. Now, that may sound like I'm trivializing it, but I'm making the point that consent is not sacrosanct in law. We routinely make children do things to which they do not consent. So why do we section out sex with an adult as something that shouldn't be imposed upon them? Well, then, I think we come down to debates about harm. And one might then make the case that, well, the problem with, with paedophilia is that uh, it's the sexual appetite of an adult wreaking harm on a child. But the problem with that is we also allow that in society. Adultery is not illegal. Adultery is the result of the uncontrolled sexual appetites of adults. And anybody who's been in the past for any length of time will know that that wreaks havoc on children. Some of the toughest pastoral cases you come across are children who've grown up in households damaged by adultery, damaged by the uncontrolled sexual appetites of the parents. So once you've got rid of those two reasons, as sort of solid reasons for objecting to paedophilia, what's left, I would suggest, not very much at all. Basically, we find the idea distasteful. So I'm actually not convinced that moral outrage against paedophilia is really moral outrage. I actually think a case can be made for saying it does conform to the aesthetic morality, which I was arguing characterizes the modern mind yesterday. Uh, incest would be another example. Why do people object to incest? Well, there, there isn't even a consent issue. There's a legal case a couple of years ago. A professor at Columbia University in New York was having a sexual relationship with his adult daughter. They both consented to it. Well, there we sort of we default perhaps to the biological argument that children could end up with terrible genetic problems. Well, use contraception. Well, the man gets sterilized. It doesn't apply anymore. Bottom line is we find incest distasteful. And I would also maybe double back on it and say this. I think the fact that we want to make sex mere recreation and yet the most heinous things that one is able to do in our society are sexual points to the fundamental contradiction in, in modern thinking. We instinctively know that sex is more than recreation. That's why rape and paedophilia are such terrible crimes. We instinctively know that. The problem is we've built our sexual ethics in a way that tries to deny that and ends, us, ends up with all kinds of contradictions. So sex is recreation, but rape is really evil. Sex is recreation, but paedophilia is really evil. 
sex is recreation, but incest is evil. I think these point to the fundamental contradictions that occur basically when we decide to live the way God has not intended. What do you expect? You're going to end up with all kinds of paradoxical positions that one has to hold, which seem somewhat incoherent. So, sorry for what, in some ways, probably a slightly distasteful way to start the, uh, to use aesthetic language, slightly distasteful way to start the lecture, but I thought that was an interesting question. And I think sex crimes do allow us, in some ways, to get to the taste issue and how powerful it is in modern culture. Anyway, back to the Reformation. <clears throat> Third lecture. Theology of the Word. One of the things I said in my first lecture was, what we need to do today is recapture uh, our confidence in the preached Word, and we need to allow our imaginations to be gripped once again by the preaching of the Word. When I was called to the pastorate uh, of my church five years ago, there were two books I read that had a profound influence. One of them I'd read before. Uh, the first volume of uh, Ian Murray's biography of Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, it's, in some ways, it's hagiography. Lloyd-Jones does nothing wrong in uh, 350 pages, more or less. But it gives a great vision of what a man whose mind has been captured by the romance of preaching looks like. And that was inspiring to me as a new pastor. The second uh, book was The Genius of Luther's Theology written by my friend Robert Kolb and Charles Arand, two American uh, Lutheran theologians. And it was an attempt to use Luther's theology to present a theology of being a pastor. And what struck me about that work was two things, really. The, the theologically driven nature of ministry, that this book was devoted to the idea of allowing theology to shape ministry and the second aspect of it that was so interesting was the centrality of the word to that. Now, a number of the questions that popped up so far have uh, touched on, you know, are you going to address sort of one-to-one -one ministry? Uh, are you going to address personal evangelism? Uh, let me just say right at the outset, uh, no, not really. Uh, I'll touch on them in, in the final lecture. Mark was a little worried yesterday. I don't seem to know exactly when I'm going to be addressing things. Data. I have prepared my lectures. I'm just juggling the material around. Uh, I will address that a little bit on the, on the final day. In not addressing it, I'm not saying it's not important. It's simply not part of my brief for these lectures, if I could put it that way. My primary concern in these lectures is going to be the word preached, not every member ministry, if we put it that way. So it's not some kind of sneaky high Presbyterian way of, of reintroducing a sort of priest craft at this point. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is focusing on the topic in hand without wishing to denigrate other forms of speaking the word. Uh, talking about the word of the water cooler, Bible studies, those kind of things. Don't wish to denigrate that. I simply want to focus, particularly this week, on the importance of the word preached. So that's a bit of background. Now a bit of Reformation background. It's well established now in historical circles that the background to the Reformation, for good or for ill, lies in a number of late medieval intellectual currents. I'm going to just uh, mention two. Uh, they should be. I think they're actually on the handout. These. My handout is relatively accurate, at least for the early part of this, uh, this lecture. Voluntarism and nominalism. Uh, these are vast subjects, so I'm going to give a, a somewhat simplistic a soundbite account of them this morning. Uh, I'm simply going to focus on, on that, which I think will help us understand where Luther's coming from. Voluntarism really rises in the late Middle Ages, 13th, uh, late 12th, 13th century onwards, emphasizing the will of God as shaping what God does. The will of God, you know, God is simple. But we make distinctions when we think about God. We make distinctions in God in order to make him somewhat comprehensible or apprehensible to us. And voluntarism held that we need to understand the world as it is, as primarily an act of God's will. The, the, the significance of that is uh, God could have made this world another way. We can't say how God must have made this world. 
All we can say is that this is the world that God made. And that attenuates, weakens, softens the connection between this world and God as he is in himself. Just because the world is the way it is to us doesn't mean we can jump back and say, well, that God must be like this then. No, God has simply willed that the world will be this way. It's kind of epistemological point, really, to limit our knowledge of God, to inject a kind of modesty into the way we think about God, to limit what we might call natural theology. The limits of natural theology are somewhat restricted when you have a voluntarist view of God. The most obvious way that it impacts the Reformation is in the doctrine of justification. If you hold a tight connection between the way the world is and the way God is in himself, it stands to reason that one would say you can only be justified, declared righteous, if you are, to some extent, intrinsically righteous. Luther, of course, will throw that out. He'll say, no, you can be declared righteous simply because God wills to declare you righteous. So there's a connection with, the most obvious connection in some ways is with Reformation soteriology and the doctrine of justification. So voluntarism is one strand of medieval thinking. The other strand is nominalism. You could in some ways write the history of Western medieval thought, maybe the history of Western thought in general as a struggle between forms of nominalism and forms of realism. Again, uh, what I'm going to give you now is, is an account that you could probably pick holes in because, you know, my time is short. But essentially, nominalism sees reality as primarily, we might say, linguistic. So we've got two dogs here, Fido and Rover. And I call them both dogs. Why do I call them both dogs? Is it because they, there is some sort of abstract essence of dogginess? in which they both participate. And by participating in that essence, they both qualify as being called dogs. Or is it more a linguistic game? I call them dogs because, you know, Tabby over in the corner is a cat. And Fido and Rover have more in common with each other than they have with Tabby, the cat. And so I come up with this category of dog to sort of group them together in this set. Perhaps it becomes more obvious when you think I have a pile of stones over here and we have all of you over there and I could say, you're all animals. I don't mean that in an insult. I'm sort of technically, as the genus, you're all animals. And the pile of stones over here, inert matter, rocks. There is no abstract animal essence in which you participate. I'm simply pointing out that there's a big difference between you and the stones. Your animality binds you together in, some way, in the same way that it binds you to Rover and Tabby and Fido, even though you're not part of the same species. Again, what does this do? Well, it presses towards reality as a linguistic construct. It reminds us or it underlines for us the creative nature of language. And what Luther does, I think, Luther's theology in some ways, is a profound reflection upon nominalism, upon a nominalist way of looking at the world, to which he gives a deep cross-centered dimension. We're going to come to the cross tomorrow. <clears throat> These late medieval currents really set up, they're, they're really the preconditions for Luther's Reformation because they break, they make a break with intrinsic qualities. And they allow Luther to start thinking of righteousness and justification, not so much as, an intrinsic, as referring to intrinsic qualities, as referring to God's declaration, extrinsic declaration. Justification for Luther, though, is deeply rooted in his understanding of God and speech. The reason I got uh, <clears throat> asked Ed to read uh, Genesis 1 this morning was you know, creation in the Bible is described or is set forth as a linguistic action by God. Divine speech is creative speech in Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
Now, we, we, it's, it's language by analogy, of course. We're assuming that God doesn't have vocal cords in the way that we have them. We're assuming that, you know, prior to the creation of matter, there was no vibration of an atmosphere to create a sound. But when the Bible is describing God's creative activity, the nearest analogous thing it can find in humanity is speech. And I think that's significant, and we will see the significance of that when we come to see the Bible's teaching on human speech. Genesis 1 and 2, divine speech is creative speech. There is nothing, God speaks, and then there is something as the result of his speech. It's not just in Genesis 1 or 2, and 2, of course. We also see it in Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. So clearly this is a, an, an image, an analogy, an idea that grips the minds of the inspired biblical writers. When they're talking about creation, they're talking about God's speech. <coughs> You can see immediately where we would sort of perhaps connect that to late medieval nominalism. I think late medieval nominalism touches on a deep truth, and that is language is creative. Um, we, uh, we have an instinctive uh, grasp of that ourselves, don't we? For all of the, the, uh, the irritation of political correctness, it does touch on a truth, and that is that speech is powerful and creative. I use a racial epithet about somebody. I'm not merely describing them. I'm putting them in their place. I'm doing something to them. The rather amusing, uh, in a sort of 21st century way, Twitter exchange was sent to me this morning. Somebody had tweeted yesterday, a very trendy left-wing person, you know, I w welcome my, to my LGBT, to my trans, sorry, to my transgender brothers and sisters. Uh, you are welcome at Planned Parenthood and you are welcome in my country. It was a response to President Trump's latest stuff. And somebody had immediately responded and said, I know you mean well, but brothers and sisters is gender exclusive language, and you're marginalizing people. And I was thinking, well, you know, uh, those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first drive mad, of course. But there's a sense that that person is pointing to a truth. And that is that the language we use is constitutive of the language of the, of the world, the reality we inhabit. We all acknowledge that at some level. There are certain words we don't like to hear. There are certain words we won't use because we know of their creative power. And Luther is, I think, mesmerized by the creative power of God's language. Here is it's one of my favorite quotations from Luther. It comes from his... Uh, oh, i find my reference... It comes from his lectures on Genesis, on speech and creation. The word is God. It is the omnipotent word uttered in the divine essence. No one heard it spoken except God himself. That is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when it was spoken, light was brought into existence, not out of the matter of the word or from the nature of him who spoke, but out of the darkness itself. Thus the Father spoke inwardly, and outwardly light was made, and came into existence immediately. In this manner other, two, other creatures too were made. This, I say, is sufficient knowledge for us concerning the manner of the creation. Interesting, uh, Luther's less hung up in some ways on the timing of creation, and more on the linguistic dimension of creation. Divine speech is the means by which creation occurs. Then this, and this uh, I think uh, is an even more fascinating quotation in many ways. Talking about the work of the fifth day, Luther says this, who could conceive of the possibility of bringing forth from the water a being which clearly could not continue to exist in water? But God speaks a mere word and immediately the birds are brought forth from the water. If the word is spoken, all things are possible, so that out of the water are made either fish or birds. And then there's this intriguing sentence. Therefore, any bird whatever and any fish whatever are nothing but nouns in the divine rule of language. Through this rule of language, those things that are impossible become very easy, while those that are clearly opposite become very much alike 
and vice versa. It's a very voluntarist statement that, you know, God's will is the determinant of what is and is not possible and is and is not real. It's also a very nominalist statement. The language is constitutive of reality. Note that phrase, any bird whatever and any fish whatever are nothing but nouns in the divine rule of language. Reality, for Luther, is a linguistic construct. He's there, you know, nearly 500 years before the uh, French deconstructionists latch on to that. But of course, for Luther, it's divine language that constitutes reality. That's what prevents him, we might say, with some anachronism, from being a postmodernist. Reality is not the linguistic construction of a given community. It's the linguistic construction of God himself. And divine language establishes the scope of the possible by establishing the actual. What is possible? Well, God speaks what is possible. There are, as I say, potent similarities with some aspects of postmodern linguistic theory, but this is divine speech. In the struggle for reality, divine speech is sovereign and determinative because it is spoken by God and grounded in God's being. We might say this, reality is what God says it is. And that, I think, allows us to set up the, the, the human problem that we now face in a fallen world in this way. Creaturely, sinful speech merely asserts a reality which is ultimately false. This becomes clear in Luther's presentation of the fall. He presents the fall as a battle over language. Commenting on Genesis 3.1, he says this, Moses expresses himself very carefully and says, the serpent said, that is, with a word, the serpent attacks the word. The word which the Lord had spoken to Adam was, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For Adam, this word, word was gospel and law. It was his worship. It was his service and the obedience he could offer God in this state of innocence. These Satan attacks and tries to destroy. Nor is it only his intention, as those who lack knowledge think, to point out the tree and issue an invitation to pick its fruit. He points it out indeed. But then he adds another and a new statement, as he still does in the church. Notice what Luther is saying there. The struggle between God and Satan is a linguistic struggle because it involves two alternative realities expressed in a linguistic form. And again, to jump forward, where I'm heading with this tomorrow, and maybe Thursday or Friday, certainly tomorrow, is I think preaching is part of the battle, part of the battle that is going on in this world and on every human heart. What is preaching? It is the statement, the proclaiming, the setting forth of an alternative reality to that which the world preaches to us. And the only question then for the congregation or for those listening is, which reality will you believe? Divine reality, as spoken by God, or creaturely sinful reality, as spoken by the world around us? And I think part of the recapturing of our notion of the romance of preaching is to recapture our understanding of, we might put it this way, the eschatological battle of which preaching is an important part. Preaching is asserting God's reality over against the world, the flesh, and the devil's reality and promoting that violent, powerful struggle within every human heart. So the Notice there, Luther says the struggle between God and Satan is a linguistic struggle because it involves two alternative realities expressed in linguistic form. And that makes the issue of language and reality a moral issue. 
and for the historians among you, you know, that's really where Luther departs from the late medieval tradition or radicalizes it. Voluntarism and nominalism were not conceived of in the late Middle Ages as primarily moral issues. They were epistemological issues. For Luther, the language you use, the way you think and describe reality reflects the morality of your heart. Luther makes nominalism, if you like, a moral issue in a way that it never was before. So the first point I want to make today is that divine speech is creative speech. And that's going to be important for my theology of preaching, because I'm going to go on to argue tomorrow that the preacher preaches God's word. And therefore, the preacher preaches creative words. Second point I want to make today, big point I want to make today, is speech, I think, is presented in Scripture as the primary mode of God's presence with his people. Make a, make a sort of simple uh, but necessary, I think, metaphysical distinction here. Am I saying that God is not present where he isn't speaking? No, no. Uh, not, in, not in an absolute sense. Uh, God sustains all things. But God, we might say, is only actively present where he speaks. Speech is a mode of presence. I think, again, we all have an intuitive grasp of that. As we have a grasp of, of speech as creative, we have a grasp of speech as uh, deter- denoting presence. It's intuitive. Uh, We use our speech, don't we? We use words, typically, to make ourselves present to other people. Uh, If you go home at night and uh, you walk in and your spouse is silent and adamantly refuses to speak to you, it's as if they're not there. You know you've done something wrong. It's as if they're not there. When I'm traveling, uh, my wife and I, we we love to, to get the occasional text or email from our sons, but nothing beats calling them on the phone. Love to hear the sound of the living voice. You know, they may be 10,000 miles away, but when you hear the voice at the end of the phone, they're more present with you. They're more present with you than they might otherwise have been. So we have an instinctive understanding, I think, of language as denoting presence. And I think in the, in the biblical narrative, God's speech clearly denotes his active presence. My favorites story, I guess, touching on this is the story of the Shunammite in uh, 2 Kings 4. Lovely, uh, lovely woman. She uh, knows that Elisha passes through uh, town pretty regularly. So she and her husband build a sort of room for him on the top of the house. And uh, Elisha asks, uh, you've done this for me. What can I do for you? And, and she basically says, I live, along, live among my own people. There's nothing you can do for me. But Uh, which which in some ways, given the rest of the story, shows what a really delightful woman she is. Um, But Elijah knows she doesn't have a child, and so miraculously, uh, well, he declares she will have a child. Miraculously, she has a child, and of course, some time later, the child dies. And she sends, she runs uh, to, to the prophet Elisha. And there's this odd moment in the narrative where Elisha gives his staff to his servant and he says run don't stop don't greet anybody on the way run as quickly as you can to this woman's house and lay my staff on the child and so the servant legs it and the woman though won't let go of Elisha no you have to come and you, know, you ask yourself, well, could the Lord not have performed a, a miracle through Elisha's staff? Certainly he could so why does the woman Why does the woman need Elisha to go? Well, he's the prophet. He's the one through whom the word of the Lord is then coming to Israel. And I think she knows that she needs God present to raise her child. And so only the prophet will do. She needs the, she doesn't need the prophet's staff. She needs the man who brings God's word and brings God's presence to his people. She needs him there. You see it, I think, in a perverse way. In the latter days of Saul, that tragedy, the night before, the night before his death on the battlefield, when he goes and and, and meets the witch of Endor, and uh, Samuel rises from the grave. Why Why is he desperate to see Samuel? 
because he knows that the word of God comes through Samuel. The tragedy of Saul, of course, just an aside, is he never calls upon the Lord himself. Never calls upon the Lord himself. Baptism narrative of Mark 1, 9. In those days, Jesus came from uh, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Well-known passage, and Mark chooses his words very carefully. The heavens don't just open there, the heavens are torn open. There was a Jewish exegetical tradition on Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That said that God would be silent with respect to his people and effectively absent from them until the heavens were torn asunder. Notice what Mark does there. The heavens are torn asunder and God speaks. God is back, present with his people. Mark's language and the fact God speaks. His presence and his speech are profoundly coordinated as Mark indicates that this prophecy is being fulfilled in the presence, in the hearing of those who are standing there that day. Notice in Acts, Christ ascends, the Spirit comes, and immediately what happens? The apostles are marked by speech, tongues, language which communicates the gospel to the very eclectic crowd that have gathered there. Suddenly, God is present with those people from all over the Mediterranean world. Speech, I think, in the Bible is the primary mode of God's presence. Luther touches on this, uh, really, in his commentary on his, his lectures on Amos. Amos chapter 8, verse 11, of course, is the famous passage. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. And Luther's comment is this, I shall send a famine on the land. This is the last blow. It is the worst, the most wretched of all. All the rest of the blows would be bearable, but this is absolutely horrible. He is threatening to take away the genuine prophets and the true word of God, so that there is no one to preach, even if men were most eager to wish to hear the word and would run here and there to hear it. This happened to the Jews in the Assyrian captivity and in the last one. The absence of God's speech there is the functional absence of God himself from his people. And Luther clearly understands that. So my second point then, God's speech is the fundamental mode of his presence his active presence in the Bible. Third point, the speech of God is the means of God's action in the world. Again, we can do this more simply, but when you think about it, already obvious in the creation, God speaks and then there are things. God's interaction with this world continues to be mediated by speech. It's fascinating, isn't it? You read the Bible, how much God speaks to his people. And then when you think of the nature of God's dealing with his people, you know, the fundamental elements of command and promise, these are ineradicably linguistic actions, I think. To command is to use words at some level. To promise is to use words. God's speech is that which creates God's people. The giving of the covenant to Abraham. Yes, there are signs that accompany it. But at its fundamental level, it is promise. This, of course, is picked up in the Reformation in their understanding of uh, the Lord's Supper and a baptism. There can be no baptism. There can be no true Lord's Supper 
without the linguistic context of the proclamation of the promise. Because otherwise they are what? Empty signs that anybody can put any meaning into they want. They have to occur within the context of language. To go back to the, the analogy I used yesterday of husbands giving wives presents. You know, if you walk up to a woman you don't know and give her a lavish present without any commentary on it, it's going to look odd. If you give your wife a present, not on a birthday with no commentary, she probably goes, okay, so what have you done? You know, what have you got to explain? You have to go to the linguistic context post hoc rather than uh, pre uh, anti hoc. But the way God deals with his people is fundamentally linguistic. And isn't it interesting, I think? It's a fascinating. The Old Testament guys here would be, be able to do a much better job with this than I can. But isn't it fascinating that the Lord chooses language and he chooses the inscripturation of revelation as his means of revealing himself to his people and perpetuating his revelation to his people through the ages at a very, very early point in written language and at a point where pretty much every other religion of which we know was hung up with images and idols. You know, we were talking yesterday about the need to be countercultural. Isn't it incredibly countercultural of the Lord to reveal himself linguistically at a time when really, you know, other gods are portrayed by images. I think there are probably a number of reasons for this. One of them is surely this. Images and idols are manipulable. We make images and idols. Speech comes from outside us and always retains its living relation to the one who speaks, even when mediated through a herald. That's why, to go back to that quotation I gave on Thursday night uh, from the Second Helvetic Confession. We believe that when the word of God is preached in church by those properly called, it is the very word of God. The minister preaches with the authority of the one who commissioned him behind him and the authority of the one who gave him the words to speak. When the minister speaks, God speaks to the congregation. And my final point today, and this is I'm going to pick up and develop this tomorrow. I also think in addition to this general theology of language that I've given, the analogy of the church to creation is fundamental. The church is clearly taught in scripture as the new creation. Colossians 1, 15 to 18 uh, brilliantly draws together the old creation and the new, doesn't it? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. That's the first creation. And he is before all things, in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The church has a close analogy as the second creation to the first creation. Christ is the important agent in both of them. And of course, this is then picked up, I think very powerfully, in 2 Corinthians 5, in a way that touches directly upon the case I'm going to try to make tomorrow. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21. Paul, again, I think he builds on the logic of the cross. He talks about not regarding uh, people according to the flesh. But then he goes on and he picks up on Isaiah's language of new creation. And he talks about the new creation in Christ. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, even though, uh, if, therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I think Paul there is building on what he's assuming will be the knowledge of his readers 
of Isaiah's language of new creation. The exile is coming to an end. The exile is being ended in Christ. There is a new creation here. And what is the practical payoff for Paul as he reflects upon this? Verse 11, we seek to persuade. Verse 20, we implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Which is a fascinating statement, of course, because he's writing to Christians. And he's imploring Christians to be reconciled. I think there he's bringing out the dynamic power of the word. You are reconciled, and every time you grasp the word, you are reconciled again. The new creation for Paul leads him to do what? To speak. You persuade by speech. You implore with speech. Because the church is the new creation, there is a linguistic act involved in it. Preaching. Pressing of the word on people. As it's the word that created the world, as God speaks and so the world was created, so God speaks and the church is created too. So, a couple of implications of of that analogy and then a brief summing up. Uh, I think... When we think of the church as the new creation, then as God's speech in the dyna- is the dynamic creative power in the first creation, we can expect that his speech will be the dynamic power in the new creation. I think as God's speech is the primary mode of his presence in the old creation, so it is the primary presence, mode of his presence in the new. And as God's speech is the primary means of him accomplishing his purposes in the old creation, so it is in the new creation. To go back to where I started, I hope, at least for some of you now, your imaginations are starting to be set on fire. Not just for word ministry in general, but for preaching in particular. All of that stuff I talked about yesterday, that's incredibly discouraging. That's incredibly discouraging stuff. The whole tide of the culture and all of the engines that drive culture seem to be flowing against us at this point. But when Paul uses that language in 2 Corinthians of new creation, he doesn't talk about Christians and the church being like a new creation. He says they are a new creation. That is incredibly powerful language. And the agent or the means of that new creation is the word of God. There is nothing more powerful than the Word of God. The Bible, I think, clearly teaches that. There is nothing more powerful than the Word of God because it is God who speaks that Word. And it really doesn't matter what documentaries ABC put on. It really doesn't. It really doesn't matter how many persuasive sitcoms are insidiously presenting an aesthetic reality that bears no resemblance to God's real reality. The word of God is powerful because it is God who speaks it. It was powerful enough to bring the universe into existence out of nothing. It is powerful enough, I think, to deal with the various cultural pathologies that we face today. So what I want to do tomorrow is move on and and start to think about how this impacts our understanding of preaching. And indeed, if you you want to think about one-to-one ministry, it's still the word of God in one-to-one ministry. And I hope that it's giving you confidence uh, when you go into a pulpit or when you speak to people that, well, ultimately, it doesn't depend upon your power. It depends upon the power of the one who speaks through you. So tomorrow we will look at uh, the theology of the word preached. Uh, And then, depending on how far we get with that, we'll shape what I do on Thursday and Friday. uh, Thanks for listening so patiently. very much, Dr. Truman. So uh, we now have time for questions. And so uh, I'll I'll ask you, if you have a question, to raise your hand and uh, I'll indicate um, who it's going to be. And someone will come around with a roving microphone. And please wait till you've got the microphone to ask a question. And also, um, 
please keep your questions concise and to the point. Thank you. So, so hand up at the back here. So you uh, Dr. Truman, you mentioned the, well, you, may, you presented the argument that one of the reasons why God is present by speech rather than by imagery is uh, that speech is non manipulatable. Um, I was wondering, uh, given that a sermon is both a faithful act of testimony, yeah. but is also a creative act of communication, yeah. um, what you understand to be distinctively less manipulable about, say, the use of the verbal imagery of sermons as opposed to the visual imagery of idols? Um, good question. I, 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 if, I, if I said uh, speech is non-manipulable, then I overspoke. First of all, I would qualify that by saying I think that speech can be manipulated. We, we talked about post-truth briefly yesterday. We live in a world where speech is manipulated, and clearly Satan or the serpent is the first great example of that. So just a, a quick qualification. I do think, though, that words have a stability to them that images and pictures do not. Uh, and I think that's the reason why human society is primarily constituted by the use of language. Um, if you want to communicate, people say a picture saves a thousand words. Well, maybe, but pictures are often ambiguous. Pictures often require us. I mean, think of the, uh, the Mona Lisa. Why is she smiling? I mean, who knows? But if Leonardo had left us with a, a piece of paper... Uh, telling us why she was smiling, then we're really left with just one choice, do we believe him or not? So I think that, uh, that language is inherently less manipulable. I think I didn't say this, I'm going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow. I, I do think that language is part of the image of God in us. It's one of the things that separates us from every other creature on the face of the globe. And I do think that language, while it can be manipulated, is not necessarily as plastic and as flexible as some of the more cynical literary critics would have us believe, who, of course, as it's always pointed out, try to communicate their own thoughts using language rather than pictures or, or other media. So without necessarily being able to give a very scholarly answer to that question, I think we intuitively know that language is less manipulable, less ambiguous than pictures. And typically, where a picture is not ambiguous, it's because we have some grasp of the linguistic context of that picture. Cross would be, a, you know, just think about it. Cross is a great example. Is it an item of costume jewelry? Is it the, the slaying of a, a criminal in the first century? Or is it the power of God, the salvation? You can't tell just from looking at the cross. You can only tell when words are attached to it. Um, uh, I grew up where people would talk about the difference between preaching and teaching. Have you been in churches where for 25 minutes you've heard someone give a talk and not preached? And what distinguishes preaching from yeah. something that you see happen <clears throat> in churches? Yeah, I'm going to try to get to that a bit on Friday, but the sort of the, the 30 second answer is I think that preaching involves the personal engagement of those listening. Uh, you can give a perfectly sound and orthodox talk on a passage of scripture, which is yet not preaching. And I go back to a comment of Luther's that, that I think somewhat captures it. He's talking about a different issue, but I think it somewhat captures what I'm trying to get at. Luther at one point is asked, you know, what's the difference in what you believe and the Pope believes? And he responds in typical sort of unexpected Luther fashion. He says, well, on one level, nothing. We believe that, that God became incarnate in the Lord Jesus Christ, died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven and will come again. He said, but the big difference is, he said, I believe he did it for me. And I think in that statement, you see the existential engagement with the truth that I think preaching is supposed to, to cultivate. Um, I think it is very helpful, for example, when a, a preacher, and I, I'm, I'm not very good at this myself, I confess, but I, I think it's good in the opening paragraph of a sermon for the preacher to let everybody in the room know that what they're about to hear 
is of importance to them. It's going to be of personal importance to you. If you're a believer or if you're an unbeliever, it's going to have importance for you. So I think that would be where I would make the difference between preaching and lecturing. You can have very passionate lecturing, which is yet not <laughs> preaching. Uh, preaching involves, I think, ultimately, like, the demand for a decision. Will you have this man to rule over you, if you like? Preaching always presses to that point. Not simply, hey, this is true and isn't a great story, but it presses home that demand. And one of the, certainly in my own, the Westminster tradition of redemptive historical preaching, the note I often find missing in student sermons is that note. They think that they've done their task. If they go to the Old Testament and show how it, you know, hey, this passage points us to Jesus. You, know, you preach through judges and it becomes, hey, this judge failed, but don't worry, Jesus doesn't. Well, what's the, so what? So what? I think it's that so what question that separates preaching from lecturing. Oh, sorry. Um, Carl, you touched on, sorry, I'm just trying to get my notes. You touched on how Luther wasn't so hung up on the timing of creation more on the divine nature of it. Just from your understanding of what Luther wrote, um, does he consider Genesis 1 the scripture of material or functional origin? Does it matter? Oh, I think he's a six-day creationist. Okay. I think he believes in six-day creation. But it's not a big issue. You know, his interest in the lectures is on the, the creative component of it. Uh, Mark might know better than me, but I, as I read him, he's a six-day creationist. Uh, but it's, it's not quite the political issue in his day that it has become in ours in some, some quarters. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, you said that God is only actively present where he's speaking. And uh, there's been a lot of traditions that have tried to approximate the Spirit's presence in the Christian life and, and what Spirit's work is in the Christian experience. Can you talk about how uh, God's speaking being his active presence correlates with the Spirit's presence in the Christian yeah, life? Yeah, I, I think I'm with Luther on this. Where the Spirit is present, the Word always has primacy. So language about Spirit-led experience being coordinate with the Word of God. Yeah, to me, that's crazy talk. Uh, that's what the Schwärmer in Luther's day will talk about a bit tomorrow, we're, we're, we're thinking about. I think the Spirit of God always brings us back and regulates us by the Word of God. I was very influenced by Jim Packer's great analogy, talking about the, the role of Spirit and Word. You know, if you go to a, uh, a rugby game of an evening and uh, the floodlights are working, you come home talking about the rugby game. The presence of the floodlights actually means the game is the, the key thing. If you go to a rugby game in the evening and the floodlights aren't working, you come home talking about the floodlights. Uh, their absence actually makes them the center of attention. And I think spirit and word are like that, analogously. That yes, God works by his spirit through his word. Through his word. So... You know, Mark and I were talking just yesterday, uh, the, the topic of the, you know, we need to take into account the, not Mark wasn't saying this, somebody else was saying this, we need to take into account the spirit-filled experience of the lesbian and gay community. M my answer is, would be to that, yes, so let's see how it shapes up to the Word of God. That's how we take into account experience, spirit-filled experience. We see to what extent it conforms to the Word of God. Is that, is that the question you're asking? Okay. <clears throat> Carl, you said that for God to speak is deeply countercultural. I just wondered what you'd think about God using language, which in itself is in some way a construct of culture, and also isn't the incarnation a deeply cultural act in that sense? Uh, yes. Uh, self-evidently, but I don't think that relativizes language, if I could put it this way. Is, is, that, is that what your point? I mean, I know there are cultural aspects to language, but I don't think that that leads me in a, a radically relativist direction. Uh, or that may not be asking, or, or the cultural side of it is, um, I'm thinking there not that language in, in the ancient world wasn't cultural. Yes, it was. But the expression of deity was not typically verbal as it occurs for 
the Jews. So God is not using the typical cultural idioms of the day, religious idioms of the day, to make himself known to his people. He's not using the idiom of uh, idols made from wood, for example, to reveal himself. He's using language and words. So, yeah, it's cultural in the, in the broadest sense that language is cultural. It's countercultural on the grounds that religion is not primarily linguistic, as I understand it at that time. So that was the point I was trying to make. Could you comment a little more on the critique of the voluntarist, nominalist sort of roots of Luther's theology that it leads to an arbitrariness in God's will and an agnosticism about God's person? Yes, and, and this is what Calvin says in the Institutes in a, in a very embarrassing passage where he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, there aren't many of those in the Institutes, but he criticizes some medieval distinctions and then goes on to basically assert their content in more or less the next paragraph. Uh, I think the thing to remember with voluntarism is it's primarily an epistemological point. What the voluntarists are not saying is that God is random. What they're saying is he might appear random to us that we cannot penetrate into the mind of God to know, to, to, to know why he behaves or acts in certain ways. We simply have to accept that he does. So the voluntarists are not really trying to make, a, as I say, they're not trying to make a point that God is capricious and arbitrary. In fact, in some ways, they're trying to say the opposite. They're trying to say he may appear capricious and arbitrary. We, should, we, we cannot believe that. We simply have to accept what he does as having ultimately some rationale in God which is inaccessible to us. Dun Scotus is one of the most radical on this when, when he's addressing the issue of why God became incarnate. Of course, the standard you know, Anselm's argument is, well, if, if the Lord wishes to restore his honor, he's got to become incarnate once he's made that decision. Uh, Aquinas' position is, well, uh, God could have saved humanity some other way, but there are certain benefits that accrue from him becoming incarnate. Scotus says... We can provide no rationale for the incarnation beyond the incarnation itself. God chose to become incarnate. Do not question behind that. So the, the voluntarism makes God arbitrary argument, I think, rests upon a, a misunderstanding of what the voluntarist was trying to do. And that is to say God is not arbitrary, but we cannot know the rationale for the decisions that he has made. Um, am I allowed two questions, or are we only giving me one? It depends how difficult they are. <laughs> <laughs> if I crash on the first one, only one. No, no. <laughs> um, so, Carl, I think I've heard you kind of say at the start that kind of there's all sorts of Christian speech, but you're speaking particularly about preaching. Yeah. Uh, and then at a point through there, you kind of said that God kind of speaks particularly in preaching. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just interested. I'm, I'm still trying to kind of grasp and comprehend. For you, do you, is there a distinction between preaching per se as kind of standing up in front of a group at a pulpit or whatever from other forms of Christian speech? Is there yeah. something that distinguishes that? Yes, I think so. Uh, I, I think that Paul talks about the public reading of the word. I think there's a corporate aspect to the New Testament. Um, I, I'm gonna, again going to talk about this a little bit later on. I think there's a competence issue as well, that certain people uh, understand the Bible better than others. They're trained, they're, their lives are devoted to understanding it, and therefore uh, their, their preaching is, is more significant on that front. So I do think you know, I'm going to make the case Thursday or Friday for, for that. But I think, yes, there is definitely a a, a status and a place for preaching and teaching. It also, I think, has ecclesiastical implications in that it's very clear in the New Testament Paul is concerned about what is being taught, uh, that elders are to be able to teach, that teaching connects, it seems to me, to a structure, an ecclesiastical structure in the New Testament. I mean, I have people in my congregation, lovely Christian people, but bottom line is they're not going to be as competent to explain certain aspects of the gospel as the elders in the church are. And therefore, I think sometimes witnessing for them may come down to come to church on a Sunday or you need to chat to my pastor about this. So, yeah, but I'm going to try to make that case uh, later in the week. Sure, thank you. Um, my second question, oh, yeah, I if forgot, it's okay. You're, you're is that a, two, yeah. Um, sorry, right at the end, you made a little statement about the fact that you think that God's presence will be mediated by word in the new creation. Uh, as it is now, 
I'm just wondering about 1 Corinthians 13 and the move from the through the glass darkly to face to face. Is there is there another manifestation of God's presence in the new creation and how does word kind of connect with that? You mean the, the new creation, sort of the ultimate consummation of the new creation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I wasn't commenting on that so much Sorry. as the church. Yeah. yeah. I know very little about the consummation of the new creation, so I hesitate to say anything about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm thinking of your lecture today, but also yesterday. Is there a continuing role for what you call therapeutic language in preaching and in the church? I think to the extent that therapeutic language often reflects the concerns of people today and is the way they express their concerns, then yes. But I think the church needs to, to take on that language, to confront it and to transform it, if I could put it that way. Are you really going then to the question of contextualization? I do think we have to be very, very careful though. I would rather use that language in that introductory paragraph of my sermon that I was talking about than use it in the main body of the sermon itself, if I could put it this way. Because I think as soon as one starts to think about the human problem as one where we need to be healed uh, or we need to be made whole, there's a real danger that we start to miss some of the fundamental aspects of the gospel. Guilt, a God who is a consuming fire. So I'm very wary about allowing therapeutic language to provide me with anything other than a point of contact to draw people in to get them interested in what's being said. I'm monolingual and God has to speak to me through English through the filter of English, how can the prism of Hebrew speak more clearly to the un-Hebrew trained mind? Has Hebrew got a deeper root in God speaking to us than just the English that we have to use? It's a very good question. I think one would have to answer on one level, yes. And that's why, you know, as part of Luther's program, part of the Reformation program, the resurgence of the biblical languages was important so that those who were going to preach the word actually had access to God's word as it was originally given. Now, there are all kinds of questions then about translation and all of these sort of things. But the move to biblical languages at the Reformation is a theological move. It's driven by the idea that those who are to proclaim the word are to be most competent in handling the word and therefore require linguistic training. So yes, I think uh, the Hebrew form of the Old Testament is important. Clearly, you and I are not going to benefit from somebody standing up and preaching in ancient Hebrew most weeks. But somebody has to wrestle with that issue. It's why it's important to have well-trained pastors and well-trained translators, I think. So very good question. And that also, by the way, means that the move away from biblical languages is a theological move. It's often done for non-theological reasons, economic reasons, etc., etc. But it does have profound theological implications. Uh, thank you, Carl. I uh, just want to push you a little bit harder on the uh, therapeutic language. It does seem that when Philip preached to the Ethiopian, he reached for that therapeutic passage from Isaiah 53 and said, by his stripes we are healed. Yeah. Is there perhaps then an argument to have a little bit more therapeutic language throughout your sermon rather I, than just in the introduction? I would certainly concede, you know, if the text, if it's there in the text, if the text demands it, absolutely. But in that context, I would want to, you, you know, want to say, well, being healed here, what does that mean? What does that mean exactly? Uh, so I'd want to give it a good grounding in biblical theology. But if the, text, if the text uses what has now become therapeutic language, I have no problem in doing that, providing we allow the text then to inform what the language means. Um, and when I say I shy away from therapeutic language, I'm not necessarily saying that those who use it are sinning or anything. I'm just saying my own preference at this point because of the things I'm worried about. <laughs> Certainly don't want to present my own preaching as a kind of one size, size fits all. But that's a very good, very good example. Um, takes me back to that question yesterday that I said I would answer, the distinction between joy and happiness. To some extent, I think uh, there's a huge overlap 
one could say between those two words. But if I was to try to formally distinguish them, to use them differently, uh, Mark very helpfully said, you know, maybe joy is, is that joy which we find in eternal realities, the reflecting on things above, if you like. Happiness can be the, the pleasure, the joy, the stimulation we find from uh, the passing things of, of this world, which can also be very legitimate, um, but ultimately not lasting into, into the eschaton. Carl, um, what do you think of, um, of linking s- scripture sometimes to um, qu- good quality sec- secular uh, material? Like, <laughs> for example, when talking about the fall, um, like just referring to J- John Milton's Paradise Lost, Parada- Paradise Regained. Um, you mean using that in sermons? Uh, oh. Just a reference. Um, I love Milton. I have to. I mean, you used a great example. I love Milton, so I'm gonna, obviously going to say I think Milton's super, and we should uh, talk about him a lot. But I, I don't have any problem with that in principle. I mean, it, it would depend on how it was done and, and what the purpose was. Uh, it's difficult to say in general what that connection to non-biblical material when we preach when we talk about Christianity is, but. Uh, I have no absolute objection to it at all. Uh, I quote rock lyrics quite a bit from the pulpit in my congregation. The great thing is that nobody over the age of 60 or under the age of 40 has any idea about what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> my, my taste is very narrow. So. Hi, Carl. Thanks for speaking to us. Um, about uh, the language of, of preaching... Um, and the, I guess the power that comes through that. There's one part of the language which I don't think that we've maybe thought about yet, and that's singing and music. Yeah. Does that same element of power come through in singing as well? And is that something that maybe rivals preaching in a way, especially when it's come from the scripture? I think the, you're making there a gr- This is something I've been thinking about recently because there are two things I think that even physiologically separate us from every other species on the face of the earth. Uh, Our ability to use speech and our ability to appreciate and hear music. Other animals just don't have the brain physiology to hear music as we do. Uh, And it's interesting, isn't it, that the Reformation brings both of those back. You know, these two things that I think one would have to say must be part of the image of God. They must be part of what makes us unique. Both come back into play at the Reformation in the sense that preaching the word and reading the word is suddenly back, and congregational singing. And so so my answer is yes. And when I talk on Friday about the the congregational response, I think singing is crucially important. And Luther knew that. Right from the early 1520s, they're starting to put together hymn books in, uh, in Wittenberg. And for those interested in contextualization, it's a fascinating story in that Luther is, there's this, though there's not much uh, in the church, it was generally choirs that were heard in the Middle Ages. It, was quite, it wasn't congregational participation. There was a strong tradition in Germany of kind of religious folk songs. And in the early hymn books in Luther's Wittenberg, what he does is uh, they use a lot of the tunes of these traditional German folk songs so that the people are familiar with the forms. And then they even use some of the traditional folk songs, but tweak them. You know, they get rid of the bits about Mary and the saints and put Jesus and the cross in. But it's a great example of where Luther is trying to enrich the Reformation, not by disturbing people, but by using forms with which they're familiar, and yet making them orthodox, for want of a a better term. So singing, I think, is very, very important in congregations. And... uh, Yes, to be profoundly shaped by the word. It's why psalm singing was so important in the Reformation. Even, even in Luther, you know, Luther's known as a hymn singer, but they sang, they had psalms in their earliest musical uh, hymn books that were translations of the psalms. So singing the word of God, I think, is very, very important. Um, Pardon me if this is a little bit um, not thought out. 
Um, I was really taken by something that you said about the need for linguistic contexts um, in the face of the ambiguity of images. And I was just kind of thinking a little bit about that um, and the way that you then took that to kind of talk about the primacy of the word. Um, there's a couple of different things going on in the Bible that kind of jump out at me as, as problematic in that. So in the creation, you have both word and image. Um, you have a, a linguistic context given to an image that's placed in the middle of the creation. Um, but at the same time, it does seem like the image is somehow kind of the, f the fulfillment or the kind of coming to its kind of fruition of the word. Um, and then the same thing in the incarnation, where you have um, God himself coming in person in a linguistic context that makes sense of that. Um, I wonder if you could kind of comment on that. Like, you seem to be kind of letting the image stuff drop out there in a way that makes the incarnation seem a little bit kind of strange, like a little bit of an aberration from God's mode of presence and mode of action. I, that certainly wasn't my intention. Uh, and I think in what you've said, I, I don't find anything really to disagree. I mean, you, you, you kept saying the image has a linguistic context, which is sort of what I was trying to say myself. I mean, the Lord's Supper, for example, has the context of promise. <clears throat> I think the incarnation has a linguistic context. It's why we have the New Testament. It's why we have the Old Testament leading to the incarnation. We need to understand the narrative and the story that culminates in the incarnation in order to understand the significance of the incarnation. In I order guess. to know that the cross is not an offense or foolishness, we need to know what we can assert about it. I guess then my question is about the movement in the other direction. So agreeing about the importance of the lingu yeah. linguistic context. Can, you, can, you, can there be a danger of letting the image drop out, of kind of actually promoting the primacy of the word there in a way that actually makes it not have its connection to its infleshedness in some way? Yeah. Yes, I think, the, I, I think that that can definitely be a danger. Um, again, I'm not trying to present a sort of zero-sum game where, hey, if you emphasize the word, you mustn't emphasize anything aesthetic. I'm simply trying to set them in their proper context. And I would look you know, to the architecture of uh, a classic reformed church where you don't just have the pulpit you also have the table with the elements and you have the, the baptismal font you have the pulpit higher than the table and the baptismal font to make a theological point but it's not that the table and the font are absent so yes is there a danger that we can uh, we can eclipse uh, the materiality of the sacraments by an overemphasis on the word. Yes, I think so. I think Zwingli tends that way in the Reformation. Of course, Zwingli's Reformation is the least aesthetic of all the Reformations. They get rid of all stained glass. They get rid of all music in the church. It is a profoundly, exclusively word, wordy Reformation. Uh, and I'm not a Zwinglian. I would have to say that's, that's wrong. That is an overreaction to the the medieval context. So yes, it's definitely a danger. The pendulum can always swing too far the other way. I don't think in classic reform theology properly understood it does, but it is. If we, if we have a weakness or a tendency or a danger or a temptation to avoid, that's probably the one. 